So thank you. All right. Good, good afternoon. Uh, hello with everyone joining us today. Um, in my data, we have uh, quite diverse uh, attendees from every corner of the world. We have from, uh, from Nigeria, we have from Malaysia, we also have from Egypt. So I hope um, you all uh, are in and can enjoy our today's session because we are delighted uh, that we have here Professor Robert Pfaff. And I will uh, briefly introduce, I mean, if we go to the CV, it's quite a long list. So I will um, briefly introduce uh, him. So Robert Pfaff is a professor of finance and formerly a director of research at the UQ Business School. He has an international reputation in empirical finance research. And his works, if you check on Google Scholar, has been, has been cited for over 15,000 times. So uh, I have an extensive experience uh, that, it, that he is now uh, will share to us. And his particular passion is nurturing and developing the career uh, trajectories of early career researchers. So if you're uh, early career, like uh, master students, PhDs, or also just graduating from PhDs, also early uh, uh, staff, uh, lecturing staff, so you're very much welcome. And this uh, session will be very, very helpful. And Robert has supervised approximately 40 PhD students to completion and examined uh, 50 PhD uh, dissertations. So has extensive experience. And building on the 35 years uh, academic research, his latest focus is pitching research, which is now gaining great traction domestically and worldwide. So now we are um, quite honored and lucky to be able to be part of that uh, worldwide, uh, let's say, vital idea. So welcome, uh, Professor Robert Favre. Uh, thank you very much, Rocky. Uh, very kind words. And uh, as I was saying earlier, I'm, I'm very excited about today's event. Uh, I always get excited when I have an opportunity to, to engage internationally. Uh, but for some reason, when I know the numbers are big, uh, it just fills me with, uh, with, with great joy. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, the online platform uh, is, is one that can give a scale. And so, Wherever you are right now across the world, um, I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you individually, but of course, there, there's, many, uh, there's many online. So this is a fantastic opportunity. I'm, I'd like to thank Usman uh, particularly for uh, uh, reaching out to me and, uh, and saying, hey, would you like to do another one of, of uh, the webinars? Um, so thank you so much. Uh, you know, without... The, the positive reaction like you have had and given me, um, I, I couldn't do this as we were talking earlier, the snowball effect. I think it's really important. And, uh, and I hope from this big snowball that we have now, an even bigger snowball takes place uh, in the following weeks, months, and so on. Uh, UQ is a, is a great institution. I know uh, many of you are at also great institutions. Um, so I'm hopeful that we, in, in future times, can build on today's work to think about ways that we can collaborate across, across the waters. Um, that will be uh, sort of icing on the cake for me. But let's, let's think about today. Um, today is about pitching research. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, hopefully uh, get the technology to work for me. Uh, it doesn't matter how many times uh, we have the technology, it is always a bit scary to and already. Uh, so I've got to decide or figure out how I can share my screen. Yeah. You can now see filling your screen a big purple slide with yeah. some green writing and then red for Indonesia. Now, I'm a little nervous because I did do a webinar yesterday um, and uh, that was into Sri Lanka. And right. uh, there, was, there was a technical problem. They uh, were telling me the, uh, the focus was a bit fuzzy. So I'm, I'm hoping uh, that, that uh, you have a clear view of the writing on the slide. Uh, Rocky's nodding his head, that's so, so that, that, that's good. Because uh, there's nothing worse than technical hitches. All right. Now, uh, the first thing that I'd like to do is to give a very strong uh, 
and heartfelt urging to all participants that you will enjoy today's masterclass uh, and you'll learn a lot, but you're going to learn so much more by accessing the written paper. So it's very easy to do. This slide uh, indicates that you can go to the SSRN and actually you can just Google, very simple Google, SSRN, uh, those four letters, and then my my surname, which is uh, my family name, F-A-F-F. -F -F. So if you Google uh, those two, then pretty much the very top item will be uh, this paper. And, uh, and it's simple to download. It's free to download. You can see 16,200 in excess downloads. It's uh, ranked number 199 out of half a million papers. And, uh, you know, this is something, this is a metric that uh, I, I've got great pride in because it's not a metric that I abuse. Um, I think if anyone that gets value out of this, and, uh, and I'm thinking of everyone that's attending right now, you're going to get the blood, sweat and tears of the 17th version, the 17th issue of, of this paper that I first put up in June 2014. And, and I think uh, the, the reward that I get for seeing those downloads increase, that, that they do in a legitimate way, I think that's uh, something that uh, is very important to me. And you will benefit. So, uh, you know, in the coming... Uh, the rest of the day or, or in the next few days, uh, do yourself a favour and get the paper. But that's enough of me giving you a hard sell about the paper itself. I want to quickly give you a, a broad feeling of my goals for today. And really, it's the first two goals that we'll spend most of the time on. And indeed, the very first goal will be the one that takes up the, the majority of time I will pause at certain places to see whether there are any questions. Um, I suppose if there's any written, if you want to, if uh, we have the facility and I, I can't check right now whether you're able to type a question, but that would be fine if you don't want to ask it in person. Maybe if Rocky is able to monitor that, because uh, I will have difficulty doing, you know, it's sort of like I can do one thing at a time. And perhaps when I stop, if, uh, if you see a good written question there, Rocky, you, you, yeah. you have uh, permission to ask me that question. Okay. okay. We do have here uh, the space to write questions, so we, we are covered. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So we're going to start very shortly with uh, me just explaining this framework that I've developed, which, you know, is, is, is deceptively simple and, and there, there will be no surprises. And, and in a way, I always feel like I've got to defend it because we're brought up to think that if someone tells us something that is, you know, a really simple message that in theory we could have come up with ourselves, we, we, our tendency is to discount it. And I think you do that at your peril here because this framework will include terms and items that you've all heard before. But the beauty of it, it brings it together it brings it together in a way that's cohesive and that it works uh, to build your thinking. Um, and it does it in a way that will benefit you. And, and, and I've put a lot of thought in how I can guide you, how I can give you hints, how I can give you tips, how I can give you steps or, or cues of what to think about in each of the sections. So I think as a package, this framework does much, much more than what you might initially think, okay? And, and part of this exercise will be to give you some insights into the philosophy that I'm, I'm bringing to this, which I believe is a very positive one and a creative one. So that's where we'll spend most of our time. We will then look at an example. Uh, and the example that I have in mind, subject to technology, is a video example. In fact, it'll be a second video that I plan to share with you. So we have to cross fingers, technology works. Uh, so there'll be two videos, they're both quite short, about nine minutes each. So the example, and I'll tell you more about the example uh, when we get there, but the first video that we'll, we'll be watching in about 10 minutes from now 
is an animation. And it's an animation that actually explains the framework. And uh, the, the slides I've already put, it's a 20 megabyte file. I've already put it in a Dropbox folder and I've sent across a link. So uh, I've, I've suggested uh, to, to Rocky and Usman uh, to share the link. Uh, happy for anyone that wants to access that Dropbox folder to get the slides. There's a lot of information in the slides. There's a lot of links in these slides that you may want to use and particularly around the resources. So goal number one, I, I like to start with this cartoon. And the cartoon comes from, I think for a lot of PhD students worldwide, a very well known uh, area or uh, a well known site. It's phdcomics.com. So I, as I've, I've seen many examples and they tend to come in a fairly standard format, a, a short comic strip that has three scenes in it. And this is uh, typifying that example. There are three scenes and there's a theme. And the theme here is very relevant to today's talk. Uh, and it's basically uh, involving a senior researcher, a, a research professor, and, and that's the older gentleman who's in all three cells, in all three scenes. So lovely green vest, red tie, beard. And I like to think of that as me. Uh, I don't have a beard right now. I certainly have the hairstyle. Um, I have had beards in the past. So I think of that as me. Now, the other key player in the cartoon is a research student. Could be a PhD student, or it might be an early career researcher like many of you in the audience. And what has led to this, this scene that we see is that the research student has given the professor uh, a bunch of material to, to read, okay? And we can see in all three scenes, there's a big pile of papers. So it's, uh, you know, it's very 20th century. Uh, 21st century, we, we don't tend to print anything very much anymore, but you can think of the 21st century version of this as a professor looking at the screen uh, and, and scrolling through a lot of pages in a, in a Word document, if you like. So there is about to be a meeting take place between the mentor and the student, the research professor and the PhD student. And what is of particular interest to the student is the feedback. What feedback am I going to get? What advice am I going to get? So the student asks in the first cell, sir, did you read the draft I left on your desk? And I reply, so I'm going to play uh, the, the professor. I've looked at it. Now, that's a very simple phrase or sentence in English. Uh, there are four words, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a linguist, uh, but so, so I can only uh, convey to you uh, that the English language can have a lot of ambiguities and there can be a lot of meanings in very simple sentences. And there's two possible meanings for that sentence or that phrase. And, and they're conveyed in the second scene and the third scene. So the second scene, the middle cell of this cartoon, is what you, so you have to play the student, okay? What you hope that sentence means. And what you hope it means is that I've been reading every page. You know, there's many pages there. So there's many pages, many paragraphs, many sentences, and many words. And I, to do that properly, I would take, I would need a long time, you know, several hours. So the question is, and, and really uh, there's the implication when we look at cell three is, that scenario probably is not going to happen. If there's so many pages, so many paragraphs, sentences, and words for a number of reasons. Sometimes, you know, professors aren't lazy. They're just very busy. Um, so they just don't have time to look at everything. And if it's written in a very unstructured, rambling way, it's sort of like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna deal with this? So what it probably means is in the third cell. And by now you've already had a look to see that I'm sitting there and I haven't touched a page. 
I've just tilted my head and there's line of sight and that's it. I've looked at it. Have I read anything? No. Do I understand or know what you've written? No. What's going to happen in the meeting? It's going to be a sad meeting. You're going to feel I don't care. You're going to feel at the end of a 30-minute meeting, you didn't get much out of it because what's happening? I'm in the meeting madly going through all the pages trying to find something. Like a, you know, it's like a needle in a haystack sometimes. Um, and the meeting will be dissatisfying. So the question is if, and that's an exaggeration, all right? Uh, but I think to drive home a message, often it's good to have an exaggeration. We can come back from that a bit and get closer to reality. But with that extreme scenario, there's a problem. And there's, there's a, a lot of related problems. But let me tell you uh, how we're going to interpret the problem here. There's a communication problem, all right? So communication is the heart of everything we do as, as uh, the human uh, race on earth. We have a huge advantage over, at least as far as I can tell, many other species. I mean, it's not to say they don't communicate in some way, but we know we're a social animal and we need to communicate in all aspects of our lives, including how we do our research. So it's actually a bigger problem than just communication. It's communication or let me tell you, there are three problems and they're all communication. So what can we do? How can we improve this situation? And, and that to me brings us to the framework that I want to share with you. It has a lot of design features that are trying to overcome what are the impediments in that cartoon strip. But we have to bear in mind, it's, it's, it's a big challenge. We, we, we have a communication challenge and we have someone that's very novice, still learning the ropes, still trying to understand the terminology, the language, trying to get their head around a big literature. They have to communicate as effectively, as efficiently as they can to someone who is an academic expert in the field. All right? It's a hugely difficult task, but I think I can give you a tool to make it easy or easier. Uh, I wouldn't want to suggest it's easy. It's never easy. So the reason I think this tool works is because it has some organizing principles that either are directly embedded or I think are very easily leveraged from the design. So it's structured, that's directly embedded, and we'll see the structure very shortly. It's brief, and it, it requires and it demands brevity, and we'll see uh, it's a thousand words. I think a thousand words is about all you need, which to me fits on two pages, right? And uh, you know, sometimes I make the joke, and I think I'll make it now, if, uh, if, if I have to use a stapler, if I have to use one of these things to staple pages, there's too much. Uh, very early on, I want the, an amount of information that I can consume reasonably quickly. I'm an expert in the field. If it's structured and in a way that I can anticipate, it may not be perfect, that's fine. As long as I can see that the novice researcher has tried, have, have, has tried their best, usually their best within a given time frame. And this would then engender a methodical approach. I think it can be clear, although there's no guarantee of clarity. But I think this, this design will help enhance clarity and help enhance the focus. So it's at this stage we've got to uh, clear the mystery. And for those that might have done some pre-reading, you will have some idea of the, uh, what the tool is. But for others... Uh, you will not uh, know at all. So, so now what I've got to do, and uh, I think I've got to do a stop share. Uh, yeah, I'm going to stop share because what uh, I need to do is, okay, so hopefully now you can see a, uh, 
it, it's a, a browser with a, a, yeah. a lovely cartoon character. And uh, I think once I hit, once I maximize this, it will start. And it's a nine minute video and explains the framework. That's uh, this way. The University of Queensland Business School. You'll come to know me as the pitch doctor. Researchers make systematic and rigorous inquiry into things. It is immensely rewarding and important work, but definitely not easy. Okay, so share. I'm going to reshare, uh, and hopefully I've got the slides back. So hopefully, uh, Rocky, yeah. you can see play nine minute animation. That slide is. Um, so it was a bit off-putting for me. I couldn't hear a thing. It was totally silent, but uh, I'm glad it seems like you could uh, hear and watch the animation. So let's just recap. Um, here's, the, here's the tool. And as I already warned you in a way, there, there's really nothing here that you wouldn't have heard of before. Um, but... The beauty, I believe, is the packaging. The packaging of all these essential ingredients. Not only that they're all there, but I've put a lot of thought in sub-packages. And that's really what I want to now emphasise. What are these sub-packages and why are they important? So what we see right now is an empty framework. It's an empty template. And the challenge for a student is to fill the white spaces, the gaps, with meaningful answers, the best that you can do in the time that you allocate for the exercise, to total around about a thousand words. I've seen some really good efforts that are 800 words, 900 words, anything less than 800, 700, it starts to get thin. I've also seen some very long ones. I've seen them well over a thousand words and they go for three pages, four pages, and, and probably they contain quite a lot of good ideas, but my experience is it's too much. You want to communicate, you want to reach out to your mentor. Now this tool is valuable on both sides. It might seem to you like I'm only speaking to the novice researcher and say, well, here's a tool. Why don't you try this? I'm also speaking to the senior researchers, the mentors, and say, here's a tool that you can set and use with your novice researchers, your PhD students, research students, whoever they are, and get them to complete this framework, or at least elements of it to start with. Maybe you'll say to them, to begin with, tell me about the first four items. And what would you be after in those first four items? Well, I'm of the belief this is the part of the, the framework and the template which is mostly asking you to frame the bigger picture. So what is the relevant bigger area of research within which that you want to put a more specific project on the table? And so this framing of the bigger picture has two related aspects. It's a little bit about what this big area is and a fair bit about, well, why is it of interest? Why would people, or why do people like studies, like research in this broad area? Okay. And those four items to me are a nice sub package that sets the scene. And as a mentor, I think I'd, I appreciate that. Um, maybe I get it without needing, uh, without having this, but maybe there's a chance I misunderstood the bigger area, the bigger zone of research that you want to work in, in terms of your research. And I also want confidence that you understand that bigger picture. Okay, so motivation's there, and that's uh, a bit about you saying, well, here are the bigger things, uh, pieces of knowledge in this broad field that we know. Okay, you start with what do we broadly know in this field and what are the things that we don't know and that scholars in the field would like to have answers to. 
So it's not only what don't we know, but what do we need to know? And that motivation really needs to bring these elements together as a foundation stone for then going to the next three items. So these are a package. And these are what I call the basic building blocks. And the basic building blocks around a specific project have two dimensions. It's mainly about how, all right? What are you going to do? So there's a little bit of what, and that's the idea essentially. And then how do you plan going about doing it? And the two main ingredients of the how, which have to articulate with the what, the idea, the two main ingredients, the building blocks are data and tools. Okay, so that's a three dimensional package. Well, now we've got, we've got an inverted wedge and it's you know, a, an inverted pyramid. It's now becoming more and more challenging. Now we have a two dimensional challenge. And these are the two key questions. So this is another way of looking at how you need to try and justify your research. You need to demonstrate as best you can that it's dealing with something that's sufficiently new and, and novel. So not trivially, trivially new and no, a novel, but is meaningfully new. So what's new? That's the first question. But that's not enough. My, the tradition is that I've seen over many years, and I know I used to do this a lot myself, is once I felt I had a good answer to what's new, I relaxed. And that's a problem because we can do something that's quite new and novel and then find out months later, no one cares. So it's like, so what? So we should have that front ended. We need something new and novel and we need to be confident that people care about it. So what would our response be to the so what question? Well then, the, uh, the inverted pyramid ends up with, with a single dimension that we have to always cover off on. And that's the contribution, the incremental contribution. I'll talk a little bit more about that one shortly in some later slides. Now, the animation also flagged up some other considerations. And this is just to recognize that even when we go through the first 10 items, there'll be other things that aren't really captured very well. Uh, and and I, I, I write about these in the SSRN paper. So getting us to think early on, well, what do we plan to do with this paper? And typically that question's framed around journals, all right? Publishing is an important objective and task for academics, even early career researchers. So what's the target journal? And, and uh, more than just one journal, are there a group of journals that we think would be interested? And then you would think about prioritizing amongst those, that group. Other things we would uh, think about in, in terms of other considerations, would be what I'd uh, call or label research risks. And so the risks that I have in mind, the three big ones that, that I talk about in the SSRN paper, the, the no result risk. So we want to avoid doing projects that we think have a high chance of no result, all right? Who wants to do research where you find, oh, nothing? Second one, competitor risk, all right? As, as time goes on, the 21st century, there are more and more researchers competing for less and less ideas or good ideas. So we should think about who our com natural competitors are, the leaders in the field. If we have a great idea, there's a chance that leaders in the field may be doing something similar and we need to find out about that. And we want to avoid the nasty situation that can arise more often than you think, and that is they publish your idea in the Journal of Finance or in the leading journal in your field before you get a chance to finish. So that's competitor risk. And the third one is the risk of obsolescence. So as best as we can, we want to avoid choosing topics that might tick every other box. So they're a uh, you know, really hot topic, but there's some concern that the hotness could disappear really quickly. Um, and that it could be under jeopardy because, for example, regulation changes. Um, one that's actually, uh, in a sense, relevant to the current 
crisis that we're facing, the, the, the twin health and economic crisis, the, the COVID crisis, is imagine if you're a researcher in a team working on a vaccine. The last I saw, there were well over 100 serious teams around the world working on a vaccine. So there's competitor risk. Now, there's also a risk of obsolescence, particularly if your team is moving slowly. Because if the leading teams get a big success and a high percentage uh, offering of a vaccine that works, so 60%, 70% of the population that have the vaccine are actually protected, then if you are not at market or close to market by then, and others also come in, then in terms of a very practical piece of research, maybe you, you sort of become, well, not necessarily obsolete, but your, your ability to, to play in that setting and, and be a part of the, the big picture is, is limited. All right, I think I'll skip that slide. So what are the themes and, and what, uh, what, how can we summarize uh, the main things that uh, we've covered so far? Well, it's a thousand words. That's the second dot point, or as I said earlier, the first dot point, a two page challenge, right? And an expert in the field can consume that amount of words really quickly. And if they can't, that's telling you something. So I often think of, uh, you know, I have 30 minute meetings with my students and I put this to the test usually because I'm so busy that I only look at the two pager as the student walks through the door. So the first five minutes or so are quite silent. I just say, okay, please sit down. I'm just reading your pitch. And I find if, if they've done a good job within five minutes, I've, annotated with a lot of red ink and for the next 25 minutes we have more than enough to discuss so the communication works wonderfully and that's dot point four and communication involves a lot of technical feedback dot point five now i'm often time poor i feel like i'm over committed and when i'm tired i'm a bit grumpy and and i think this this framework this tool, this template is something to help me out when I'm going through these troubling times. Okay, middle dot point there is to drive home that as a communication tool, the two key parts to it are initially the written part and that then gives a foundation for the oral part. That's where you get the interaction or at least valuable interaction as opposed to I sit in my office, I read it, I scribble some notes and I hand it over to you and you read the notes and that's your feedback. So there's a written and an oral part to this. A um, couple of dot points down, interactive and non-linear. One thing that maybe you're a little fooled by and I need to destroy this, any misconception on your part, is you might think, well, I think the message is I just start at the top and I work down one item by item and I get to the bottom and, and you know, I've probably done an okay job and I'm finished. Wrong. I think it's, it, it, it needs to be seen as a very non-linear process. So you may not start at the top. You might start with motivation. You might start with the idea. And you may then go upwards or downwards and you may come back. I think... The, the simplicity of this framework allows you to develop your thinking as you go. You are forced to be concise, and so you'll be able to see the broad themes that are coming out in your writing that you can fix up as you go. So it is it, its best value is to be used non-linearly and interactively, recursively. Now, the final three dot points in red I want to quickly emphasize. Don't strive for perfection, particularly early on. I've just told you it should be interactive and, and non-linear. If you go into too much effort perfecting something, you're likely to change it. Um, and so why perfect something that is, for at least a, a little bit of time, a tentative answer? 
Um, it's about starting a conversation. And in the end, not only do you want good answers to each individual item, you want them to connect. You want them to work together. You want them to communicate a message that not only you understand in a connected way, but the person you are directing them towards can also understand them in a connected way. Now, I've got a bunch of slides that I'm going to cherry pick some, some advice for you relating to each item. But I think at this stage, I might just pause and uh, see whether there are any uh, critical questions that you might have. So if there have been any typed in, um, Rocky might uh, be able to tell me uh, if there's a good question to ask yeah. or maybe yeah. we'll try that. Yeah. Yeah. Have we have some questions, questions coming already. And um, the first is uh, related to the kind of research. Will this work uh, for qualitative research, this uh, template or this mm. framework? Yep. Uh, that's a good question, and I've, uh, I've encountered that one uh, quite a number of times in the past. Uh, I'm, I'm of the view that it is adaptable to that. It, um, it requires some broader thinking around some of the items, and probably uh, the ones that are most um, in my mind uh, that need to be thought more carefully are the idea, the data, and the tools. So uh, I might actually use that as a prompt or just going to uh, some of the things I say about ID because this is where there would be a difference of advice. So I'm a quantitative researcher, so a lot of things I tend to, to uh, put into this are more from a quantitative point of view. And, and uh, item number 29 on this slide is a good example uh, because what, I, what I'm hopeful for in many cases, but not all, is that if the idea can be expressed as some prediction or hypothesis that you have in mind, then write it down. Now, in qualitative, and I'm not an expert, but many people have told me, uh, it's very rare that you'd have a hypothesis of prediction. That's just not what, what you're trying to do. You're actually trying to understand how the world works in a particular, probably small situation, case study or whatever, you're interviewing, you're observing or, or, or whatever. So you wouldn't you wouldn't be writing down a hypothesis of prediction. You'd probably be writing more about theory and the, and the relevant theory, uh, the extant theory that might give you a basis for how you attack the problem. Uh, if you're a qualitative researcher, um, the data is, is a little different. So I have quantitative data in mind. So, you know, I think the first point I make here is, um, you know, generally relevant. So whatever your data thoughts are, they should be fit for purpose. So if it's qualitative data, it's going to be around, you know, typically some interview or the way in which you, you collect the, 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 um, the, the transcript, you know, the, the recording of the interview or whatever. So, so, so you have to be a bit flexible in how you view the data. And quantitative, the data tend to be uh, largely numerical in qualitative, obviously, they're not going to be numerical, but there'll be still a data concept. And you still want to go with, as 38 suggests, the gold standard for your field. And then in terms of tools, I think this would be the other one where a little bit of adaptation is needed. Yeah. You know, again, it's thinking of what are the, the, the contemporary tools, the tools that are, again, gold standard, the, the the, the techniques that you use, whether quantitative or qualitative, that will do the job. So with qualitative, you know, there are some of these programs that uh, Lexi Manta is one that comes to mind, which will, uh, and I forget the other one, uh, there's, there's sort of two that I've, I've, I've seen that are quite popular where, you know, you would feed in the transcript of an interview and it would try and extract themes out and that you might code those up in some way there's some, there's some toolkit. And so whatever the toolkit that is required around the, the basic method that you need to use, um, then, then your answer would be relevant for qualitative here. So I think with some adaptation, qualitative uh, works fine. Um, one of the resources that I refer to later in the slides is uh, 
a library, an e-library of over 200 examples. And mm. they're dominated by quantitative, but there's um, quite a number, probably uh, 30 or 40 qualitative examples that you could have a look at. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think other questions are more related to the examples. I believe we will also go through some examples. So, right. so far, that's all the questions we have now. Okay, very good. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you uh, and ask for uh, whether there are, are more questions uh, a little later. Um, so I just want to cherry pick a few more things. I've already picked out a couple in, in answering your question, but or well, the question that, uh, that you fed me from one of the participants. Uh, the basic research question, I, I, I've seen examples where uh, a novice researcher, and I can understand why they do this, but it, it's a bad strategy. They think, uh, this is such a complex area, I don't have one research question, I've got five. You know? and, and I think that just complicates it too soon and you've need, you need to figure out, well, what's the main question? So, you know, you want to communicate, you understand what the main question is, not five different questions, which might just reflect that you're not quite sure. And, and maybe you aren't quite sure, but you have to make a call. And so it's much better to get a more succinct, direct key question down than having this big complicated um, answer. So item 10 here gives you, you know, a simple rule of thumb. There's, uh, you know, there's no science to the number three, but I really love the number three. Uh, I, I try as much as I can in my life to, to live by the rule of three. And so this is one example. Think of a question that will just involve the three most salient or critical relevant things that you want to do in this research. And, and uh, one of the reasons is, you want to flag this up. You want to flag it. You're communicating. So don't list five things or seven things. That just confuses people. It confuses you. Sure, the world is complicated and, and you need to, to cope with those and grapple with those. That is something for downstream. Right now, just get the main question down. The key papers. Now, again, I, I love three. So I, I'm sort of a big fan of tell me the three key papers. Now what I'm after here is uh, I'm trying to challenge a novice researcher to distill out of their immersion of the literature the three most influential pieces they found, the three most influential articles that they found. Now what I'm hoping to gain from that is, is a number of things, but one of the most important is confidence that you're reading the most or the highest quality research at the frontier of knowledge today. Not the frontier of knowledge 10 years ago, not the frontier of knowledge 20 years ago, because in many areas, our knowledge changes very quickly. And some of the things that were important back then are now not important anymore. They're redundant. So the idea of these key papers is to flag up that you are, the influential work is at the forefront of knowledge in your field. And so item 20 on this slide really tries to drive that home. Because I like to see key papers that are very recent. And an obvious question is, well, how recent do they have to be? I think in a lot of fields that, uh, that we're interested in, say business school, fields, finance, accounting, management. Five years is, is a nice rule of thumb. So I'm, I'm veering from three, I could say three, uh, but five I'm happy with. Now in some fields of research, five years is way too long. You know, think of fields where you're doing medical research, probably the papers are, are much shorter, they can be produced much more, well, I was gonna say more quickly, but obviously they have to be done carefully. So the life cycle of a, a research paper in some field is, is, is much more narrow. So recent enough, maybe 12 months or six months because things change so rapidly. The other extreme of this or the other angle to this is if maybe you're in the history area, well, the nature of history is that you want to look at some of those really old pieces. So five years would be crazy. 
So it is dependent on the field you're in. But uh, the default I would go with is no more, uh, no older than five years. Second is to get confident that you're at the forefront of knowledge is choose papers that are written by the recognized leaders in the field. They're likely to be the ones that are creating the forefront of knowledge. And if you're reading or you're influenced by what, at least right now, are not recognized leaders in the field, I'm worried. I'm worried that you're going to have a, a piece of research that doesn't connect to where the action is. And the third piece of advice is, I think you're gonna be close to the forefront of knowledge if the articles or the papers that you choose as your key papers are published in leading journals in your field. And the best example I can give, and it's an extreme one, in my field, there are just three tier one journals. So I'd be mostly looking for articles from the journal of finance, the journal of financial economics, or the review of financial study. Now, finance is not your field. I'm sure you would have some knowledge or you can get advice on what the top three or, or you know, the super important tier one journals are. And that's where you should put most of your attention. All right, cherry picking some more. Well, the motivation, I already talked about that previously. I won't dwell on that anymore. I've talked a bit about the idea. I mean, I like uh, number 33 I've highlighted in green. Um, theory is important. In fact, take this uh, together with item 30. So I don't have a dedicated theory part to the template, but it is important. And I think it would come in in a brief way when you're talking about the idea. So you can refer to well-known labels of theories that are relevant to what you wanna do. And 33 is basically saying, well, think about it, whether there's any theoretical tension you can exploit. And it's, it's not unusual there'll be theoretical tension, uh, but it's not guaranteed. And, and what I like about the theoretical tension, it can give you some additional predictions. So you might predict a positive relationship due to theory A, a negative relationship due to theory B. And, and in a way, that's going to be a nice situation to be in because now you've got a better chance of finding something, finding evidence that will support one or the other. Now, if you find an insign insignificant result, then, uh, then, then you, haven't, uh, you haven't quite succeeded, but uh, that's that's another story. I talked about data um, and I talked about tools. I mean, contemporary tools and methods. In finance, uh, things have been moving rapidly of recent times. One of the big issues uh, in finance is we, we, we feel like a better research paper is one that tells us about causal relationships or causality. But it's super hard to convince critical reviewers, so reviewers that can see the, the weaknesses in our search, it's, it, it's, it's super hard to convince them that you've got evidence around causality. And it often is intertwined with endogeneity and concerns about endogeneity that would need to be couched in terms of the methods that are at the forefront, the contemporary tools. We don't have time to go into that here, but that would be something I'd expect to see in a lot of finance pitches. So what's new? I think uh, we don't need to dwell on the novelty question, the so what question. I talked about those earlier and contribution. But I will say a little more on contribution because a question I often get is, uh, or, or I get a, I read a, a, a pitch and uh, the student has basically just copy pasted what they said for what's new. The contribution or they copy pasted what they said for so what for contribution and and this always leaves me a little um a little sad because i you know I, i'm hoping for so much more what i do recognize is the contribution probably has elements of the novelty and the importance intertwined but now the challenge is to go much further than that or as far as you can so don't just take a narrow view that or well, contribution is because it's new or that it's, it's important in, in a way that I've already explained. 
Now it's thinking about, well, what have we learnt? What could we learn from the research project that will help push some boundaries even further? And if you're really lucky, so here's, a, here's an aspirational goal around contribution, that you actually come up with a paper that's not only new and novel, not only important in its own right, but creates a pathway to a brand new stream of research. And that, if you can do it, and unfortunately only a few people get the opportunity to, the you know, luck or whatever, if you can do it, the contribution that you can claim to the literature is super. It, it's just uh, uh, very, very large. So I've talked about other considerations. I'm going to pause there again. I don't know whether we've had uh, time uh, to pick up any more questions, but maybe if there's one uh, good one that you've got there, Rocky, okay. if not, I can, I can continue. Yeah, we have a question related to risk. Um, yes. There is, um, yeah, the question is that, um, what if, uh, related to the risk of obsolescence, uh, obsolescence, and what should we do if that we are facing that risk? For example, uh, this is a PhD, and then he is finishing his PhD, and then two years later, he found out um, there are many, uh, or there's another person working on the similar idea. And what, what should I do? So maybe the question yeah. is more related to the obsolescence. What should, can we do uh, anything? Well, it sort of is, but it, it's one that happens quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I've, I've seen so many cases with, of it with my students. I've, I've experienced it myself. Um, and, you know, when it happens, well, you know, you, you, uh, you have to think, you know, sometimes it's, you just have to throw up your hands and say, I'm very unlucky. And, uh, and so you sort of almost, in some cases, you have to abandon it. And that's pretty sad. Usually, uh, it's not quite as dire as that. Um, you can think of a way of pivoting your research in to, to, to try and find a new space that is still meaningful and, and will allow you somewhere to go. But I think in the end, while it might be a bitter pill to swallow, if you really... If it is one, if it, if it's a case where you've just been beaten and there's, you know there's not much you can do to pivot, you cut your losses and you go. You know there should be you should have other projects that you work on. But that that's pretty sad and, and devastating. I think in terms of planning, while we don't have crystal balls, so we don't know who who might be out there that in two years time will will do this to us. I still think it's worth just having a, a pause and. You know, the leaders in the field, so the three key papers, uh, you, you've identified some household names there are working on very similar, or published very similar papers that, that you're building on. You might ask the question, what chance is it, what chance is there that some of those authors have had similar thoughts and might have a working paper that you need to find or you need to look for? Um, look for conference presentations that they've made, SSRM papers that they make available. Now, in the end, it's, it's not foolproof, but I suppose like a lot of messages I'm trying to share with you is don't delay your thinking in any, on any of these too much, including thinking about obsolescence uh, and try and take a, a proactive stance rather than a reactive one when it actually uh, it actually occurs. But it's a horrible situation. There's, um, there's no perfect answer. It's, it's something we all have to anticipate. It's going to happen to all of us. And uh, it's a test of our resilience. Do we pivot? Do we abandon? Uh, what do we do? Right, right. So it's better to be aware of what's coming rather than being ignorant to that. As much as we can, yes. Okay, thank you. That's all. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. So um, I now want to move on to, uh, well, well, we'll see how we go. We'll definitely do the uh, video example. And I might, I've got another one I can talk to you about. I won't do the full example. I think by then uh, we'll be getting a bit weary uh, and I'd probably want to open it up for questions at, again at that stage. But uh, one step at a time. What I want to do is just set up this video um, so that you can get the most out of it. So it's, it's a nine minute video and it's basically a, a recording from 2017 for a competition that I've run every year except this year at UQ since 
215. So five times I ran this and I was actually talking uh, before the webinar started of maybe this is an idea that we could work on in the coming months uh, for your part of the world. Um, you know, maybe this will happen, maybe it won't. But this is an example of the sort of thing that I could envisage might happen um, with my help for, for you or people that are, that are watching and listening to this um, webinar right now. So Keris Downing um, probably has graduated. She was a PhD student near the end of her first year, three years ago. Um, I'd be confident she's probably graduated and done the research now, but at this stage, she entered the competition and she is um, in a health related or medical uh, field of part of UQ. So UQ is a comprehensive university and all comers were allowed to enter the competition. So as we can see from the title on this slide, Keras's research is to do with hearing difficulties and it's narrowed down to young children, school age children. And, and I get from listening and I've seen her uh, recording a number of times now, and you'll see it uh, very shortly. Probably the, the target age of, of children she's uh, looking at is, you know, anywhere from five years old to, to probably 10 years old. Um, and that makes sense because it would seem to me, and I'm not a medical person, but the difficulties of hearing will already be quite evident and manifest in, in, in of those ages. And uh, beyond that, you should already be, they should be treated in some way. Now, she's going to tell us about a new technique that she was pitching around how you diagnose these uh, conditions. And there's a, a particular narrow type of sound related diagnostic, uh, a narrow band technique that she was, she's going to argue to us, um, does an okay job, but we can do much better. And there's a much big, bigger spectrum within sound waves that can be utilised to do better diagnosis, not only of school aged children, which is, which is her area, but she alludes to, and this is where she could have done a better job around contribution, but alludes to learnings that we get in this setting could open up a, a broader area of just helping those generally with hearing difficulties, not just school-aged children, adolescents, young adults, middle-aged adults, senior adults. Okay, so what I'm going to do is again... Right, so hopefully now, Rocky, you can confirm uh, the yes, no. yeah, web page. You can see it. Uh, yeah. So it's it's a green. There's a green banner using an emerging and innovative technology, etc. Yes, it's visible. now. What I suspect is the same audio problem will occur for me, and I'm hoping also, but also you will hear it. If if if. If there's any issue of the audio, let me know. If I if uh, if you don't come back, I'll just assume it's working <laughs> fine, and uh, I'll just I'll let you know. Uh, yeah, you let me know. Here we go. Good afternoon. My name is Keris, and I'm also from the HABS faculty, but the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. And I'm here to talk to you about my research entitled "Using an Emerging and Innovative Technology." wideband acoustic emittance to diagnose conductive pathologies in school-aged children. I will stop sharing. I will... Uh, we're back. If, uh, the slide, yeah, that looks good, Rocky. Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, you, you, I don't think you would have guessed that, you know, uh, Attending this webinar, you would have been exposed to an example of research in a medical field like this. Uh, for, for most of you, if not all, um, this, this is nowhere near your research area. But I think you will agree. So it's an interesting uh, topic. It's one uh, that we can all relate to. We can all worry that if our children have some sort of hearing difficulty, 
we want to help them. So we can relate to what is a, a really important issue to the community and, and health research. Now, the benefit we've got in terms of listening to Keris's pitch of her research is I've, I've helped you with this tool. I've given you this tool. This tool is the basis upon which Keris has, has told us about her research. Her research. And if, we, if I just scroll back, um, actually scroll forward, uh, I just want to show you, and we're not going to go through, you know, she had about a 750 word or 800 word pitch. So there is a written version of it. And she had to be more succinct about what she told or delivered in the, the recording that you've seen. But basically it's all here. Um, there's a big paragraph there on idea. There's the data. She talked about normative data set, a clinical data set. The sample size, she needs 562 ears uh, to get uh, the sort of power in the testing that she's after. Uh, she told us about the tools, so on and so forth. So, so, so it's all there in the written version. We've seen her orally presented. She was in front of a live audience. She was trying to win a competition. She came second, which is, which is pretty good. Um, so she succeeded. And, and hopefully that example drives home to you, I think, what benefit and advantage you might be able to get out of this yourselves, recognising that you've understood to some degree her research and you're not an expert in the field. So there's another, um, there's another example here which we don't have time to play, but if you access these slides and you want to watch Shari O'Brien, she was in the year before, uh, hers is another health-related one, a very interesting pitch if you wanted to observe that yourselves um, in your own time. There's a written pitch here that I'll, I'll quickly just tell you a little bit about, but in the interest of time, I think uh, I want to leave some, uh, some time for some final questions if there are, aren't any. But uh, Dr. Rhea Laportsis did this pitch for me, well, over five years ago, in fact, six years ago, almost to the day. In fact, today, it's the six-year anniversary. And another health-related one. So uh, Parkinson's disease is, is a really horrible disease, and we know it's one of many that can um, afflict us, not just the elderly, but uh, at any age. And, and Rhea was viewing this from, I believe, a psych point of view, so psychology. And, and it, it was... As we can see in the, the working title, it's looking at whether dance, a dance intervention, so providing something that is seen as fun, as relaxing, can have a positive medical effect on someone. Well, not only Parkinson's disease, but she had the elderly in her sights as well. Now, one of my reactions to this is, it would have been a more effective pitch just to pick one of these, not both in the same pitch. So either focus on Parkinson's or focus on the elderly. And when we look at her pitch, um, we can, and so this is just the version she'd written for me, uh, two pages, and here's a, a slightly easier version in PowerPoints. But we can see that in many ways, her main focus was Parkinson's disease because we see the research question here, it is stated as, is it possible to use dance as an intervention to improve the motor and cognitive function in Parkinson's disease? Now, when we look at the key papers, there's a mix here. She actually has some that are focusing on Parkinson's disease as uh, the third paper, but the second one is looking at the elderly. And the first one is looking at Parkinson's. So two Parkinson's, one elderly. Um, so. It's, to me, just diluting the message. Um, now, one thing I found uh, a little, um, let me say, I don't want to make it sound too dramatic, but disturbing, when I get to the data, she says older adults will be healthy individuals over the age of 50. And, uh, and you know, because I'm a little bit north of 50 years old, I'm a little... I just don't see myself as really super elderly that she might have had in her sights. You know, she could be taking me in in, uh, in a group and 
doing this intervention of a dance to see whether it might have some positive effect. So if I were giving her advice and she wanted to look at the elderly, I'd actually say, are you sure 50 is high enough? Maybe you want to go to 70 and maybe these days even closer to 80. But of course, if you're going to give these uh, patients this type of intervention, you need to be make sure make sure that they they're up to it uh, physically. You don't want to create some sort of other health problem. Um, you know, if they fall over, if they're unsteady on their feet. So you know, the interesting part of this is the idea is is intuitive to those that aren't experts in the field. So it's sort of saying, well, let's have some physical activity. Let's make it fun. So most people would see dance as fun and, and see where this helps around the motor function and the cognitive processes of these two different types of patients, the, the Parkinson's disease patient and the elderly patient. And I think a big uh, idea or thrust of her idea here is that it needs to be fairly lengthy, you know, not just one or two dance exercises, but I guess weekly over a six month period. So that's quite a regime of uh, dance intervention. So there's this stuff here about different measures uh, in terms of tools to, to get a baseline of, of what they're like prior to the intervention and then uh, have some observations along these different measures, either Parkinson's related measures uh, or just a battery of the uh, neuropsychological tests. So as I said, she, she comes at it from a psych point of view and, uh, and then goes on to talk about why it's new and, and why it's important. So it's going to improve, if it works out, the quality of life for the, the Parkinson's patients and, and the elderly. And um, she says here it's the first study to investigate brain activity in PD patients and the elderly while dancing. Uh, but as I said to you earlier, I would like this part to say more than just repeat that it's, it's new and novel. So what is it about this idea, this research idea that could be the platform for a, a, a new stream of research, if you like? Um, what I wanted to quickly do, and uh, I know we're, we're really pressed for time, is just show you one other quick thing that I've done with, um, so, so I use it as a reverse engineered tool with students, particularly early on. So uh, for, for quite a number of students, I think, well, I don't want to challenge them too much too soon. So a stepping stone is to say, okay, you've identified a key paper, go away and read that paper, in a way that allows you to extract information to populate the pitching research template. So instead of the working title, you can write down the full reference details, distill out of it all the information for the other items. When it comes to other considerations, let's change that and make it the key findings. What are the three key findings? And I find that quite a, a useful stepping stone for students. Now I want to show you uh, an example of a written communication or feedback that actually happened. So a number of years ago, I, I, um, when we were still traveling, I was traveling to Poland and uh, in advance of getting to Poland to a university there, um, there were, I, I received a number of written pitches. And so this is a vanilla version of one I received. It's in a, a finance related area, finance slash tax. So it's it sort of got under overtones of tax evasion. So the impact of thin capitalization rules on corporate uh, debt structure, evidence from a natural experiment. So we're not gonna go through this in detail. I just wanna show you what it looked like before I use my red pen and other pens. And then this is a, not a perfect photograph with my phone and and we don't have time to look at this in detail, but it's the visual feel of with a, a few words, like just um, less than a thousand words on page one, I 
in the end decided there were 16 items I could talk to her about or communicate a message to her about to help give her feedback. And in some, uh, in, in several of the cases, it was somewhat technical feedback, okay? And so I don't have the second page um, on my slides, but there was almost as many on the second page. So I had like 30 things just from two pages of notes that conform to this framework. And to me, that's a very compelling argument for what this can do to improve communication. Because if she'd sent me 20 pages, 30 pages, there would have been a psychological barrier to me reading those quickly, carefully enough. And this is the alternative. So 30 things that was much, much more, uh, going to give us much more items to talk about than you could talk about in, in 30 minutes or even an hour. So what I did do to help her out, because my writing's so scribbly, I did type it up uh, so she could read it. So this is just a typed up version. Uh, we don't need to dwell on it. Here's a second quick example. Now, this is not a finance example. There's a story to this, but I won't bore you with it. I had uh, Jared Muller, who's sort of in uh, an agriculture type of research area here at UQ. And uh, I read his paper, his pitch on the effect of diet quality in milk delivery in newborn calves. I know nothing about this, but I can show you that, and it was like a 700 word pitch. I, even as a non-expert, could give Jared, so on this page, there are 10 items I identified. It got up to 21 items that I could talk to him about to give him feedback and communicate, not in this case, technical feedback, because I don't have the technical training, but I would argue still valuable feedback on how he could construct a better pitch of his research ID. So I think I'll pause there. I'll, I'll hopefully this five minutes just to quickly show you some of the resources, but I just want to see Rocky, how are we doing for time? Do we have yeah. time for any more questions? And do you have one or two you could Okay, we have um, uh, some questions. Maybe I will like uh, come on, um, merge them into two main questions. First is related to the key papers. Mm -hmm. um, what is the risk if we don't in if we include the older paper? Uh, you mentioned before we have to we have the recent one. Uh, what's the risk if yeah. we include the older paper? And how is there any optimal number for the papers that we should include? I like three. I mean, in the end, it's, there's no science to this. I just like I think three is enough, is challenging, and I like to challenge you. Uh, I've had stu you know, students say, oh, can, I, can I do six, or can I do nine, or can I do four? And uh, for no other reason that I want to challenge, I just say, no, give me three. Now, the risk is if you, and, and one of the reasons you'd be tempted to put a really old paper is that there's a super, you know, there's an old paper, it's seminal, seminal work, and you think it's really important, it's influencing me. I would still say keep it out. Now, what is the what, what what is the cost of doing it? It takes a space, all right. I'm your mentor. We if we don't understand what the seminal works are, then I sort of I shake my head and think, oh, oh gee, this is not the place to tell to, to discuss seminal work. This is already sorted out. So it's not a it's not like a quiz. It's not an exam. It's not like I'm the mentor and I, I want to see whether you know what the, 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 the seminal works are. Let's, we, we have to assume we know we're on the same page and you're just wasting a space. So that would be the reason why I'd say, don't give me the old stuff. My main concern is show me you're at the frontier or at least give me good confidence you're at the frontier of knowing. Right, right. Okay, um, another question is uh, related to the uh, usage of the pitching framework. Can we use it for systematic literature review as well? Um, look, you could. I have had some students do it that way. Oh, well, sorry, actually, I misunderstood. So, actually, the, I have had students that have uh, read a literature, uh, like a big review paper and, and, uh, and uh, reverse engineered that, but that's actually not the question. And, and I, I sort of think you, you sort of struggle to use it that way. 
I've had students suggest that they could, as they're reading the literature, do one of these for each paper. And, and I think for most of us, there'll come a point where you'll say yes, but then no anymore. Because I think it, it will put too much burden on you um, in terms of the effort it takes because for the really important papers, I think it's a super idea. And, you know, whether you just limit it to doing it to the, the three most important, uh, the 10 most important, but I think there comes a point where when they're getting less important, the time that's required to do this isn't worth it. And everyone has to make that judgment. So I'd be very happy for you to do some type of, you know, use it as a framework for doing some element of a, a systematic literature review. I think for most of us, you're not gonna push it through to do every single paper in, in your literature. Some of you, you might have a good reason to do that, but I'm not recommending it. So, um, you know, every area is different, every person's different. Mm -hmm. You really see great value, um, I suppose, but don't feel like uh, you're compelled to do it. Right, right. Okay. Maybe before we continue, there's one more question here related to the paradigm. Um, how, how deep or um, explicit should parad the, the paradigmatic aspect be visible in the uh, pitching framework? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think if, there, if, if, there's con if there's potential for confusion between the parties, then you probably, or, or sort of, uh, some debate, then you probably want to make it fairly explicit. Uh, if there's no confusion, if it's pretty much, well, we know, we've, we've agreed on the paradigm. So, uh, you know, multi or interdisciplinary research is another difficult area. And, uh, and so that would, uh, you know, you're likely to have competing paradigms in, in that situation and it makes it super tough maybe uh, it starts to push this framework to the limit. Um, it's a call that you, you know you need to make and, and, and I think it would be around what what's needed what do you feel is needed to get the, the clearest message across and if you feel you have to have more fingerprints of what the paradigm is, then put them in. If you feel you know you can go soft on that because there's no, there's no conf no potential confusion, no debate. Then then go soft. So there's it, not a, a single answer. It's it's just use use your judgment. Right, right. Okay, that's uh, so far we yeah. have. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're, we're at goal three, and, and this won't take long because uh, as as we've already discussed, I've made the the slides available to you, so that that link will be shared at some stage, and uh, you can get these slides and basically just have a look through what what's available, there's all sorts of things, uh, and you cherry pick. So, you know, many of you wouldn't be that interested in having a look at these SSRN papers that basically collect together all the, uh, the finalists of, of the UQ pitching competition. So, um, Keras is in this one, the final one. So Downing, that, oops, go backwards. Uh, that's her name there. Uh, the other, uh, video that we didn't watch, Shari O'Brien, she's part of this one. So there may be uh, something there that you want to look at in terms of written examples. Um, there's also a bunch of videos that I've basically videoed the first three years of finalists. So if you get these slides and you're looking at it in, in slide uh, presentation mode right now, you hover over those and all the links are ready. But if I were to click, uh, you would uh, then then find the video and you could watch it. Again, you would only want to cherry pick here. Uh, there's, a, there's there's far too many to, to watch them all, and I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, wish that on any of you. But there's there's plenty of resources that way. Um, I alluded to it earlier, and I've only got a screenshot here, but this is the link to a library of around about 240 examples. So the screenshot just starts uh, with the letter A. Um, in, in, you know, it's, it's organized alphabetically. And so we've got some accounting examples here. We've got software development, agile software development, and agricultural economics, archaeology, auditing, and even an aviation example. 
So um, that would be worth a look if you were trying to get a written example that was close to, to your area. Now, I've got a broad range of examples uh, across the 240. The most common one I've got is in my field. So there's probably around about 50 or 60 finance examples. There's probably about 20 or 30 accounting examples. And beyond that, there's, there's, there's a number, a bit less of management, marketing, strategy. I've got tourism examples. And uh, you know, if you're interested in getting access to some of those written examples, then this would be a good link for you to try out. Um, there's, a, there's other SSRN papers. So I, I, uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote a, uh, a resource center paper. So if you're interested in just seeing what a collection of all the resources that that, that might be, um, well, that are available, that might be of some interest to you. Um, we've even got a, a free web portal that on the move you could use this. You just, it's free registration, uh, pitchmyresearch.com. Uh, you can go in there and just uh, create a pitch. You click uh, when you're finished and it will create a PDF version of, of the pitch for you. So that might be, of some interest to you. We actually use that site um, quite a bit. Uh, I did, there's a few things that we have um, provided a service for. So our local accounting and finance association um, you, uh, use the, the website for their grants. So there's a grant scheme they've been running, well, for a number of years, but the last five years they've uh, We've, we've received the applications for the grants through pitchmyresearch.com. And um, the other thing I use it for is I've run several Shark Tank uh, initiatives. So basically, it's, it's another angle on the, the pitching competition where you can pitch your idea to journal editors and the editors will give uh, either a green light, it's like a thumbs up, an orange light, thumbs sideways or a red light, thumbs down. Um, so that, uh, that's also uh, something that, that, that I've experimented with. And, uh, and for some of those, we've, we've um, accommodated on the pitchmyresearch.com website. So just to round up, and, and if there are any final questions, happy to, to answer them. Um, I really commend to you strongly, if you haven't downloaded the paper, uh, to get access to it. Hopefully you've, you've seen a lot of encouraging signs from, from this webinar. You, your interest is piqued. The, the SSRN paper is a permanent record for you. So you download it, you've got a PDF, you can scan it, have a look. There's lots of advice in there, and then you can come back to it later and, uh, and, and uh, read certain sections or, or refresh your memory. So do yourself a favour, get that, that paper. I know there's a lot of you online. And, uh, and for me, uh, I feel if you have already convinced that you, you've benefited from this, then I think it's quite legitimate that um, I get some recognition by the fact that, that you've downloaded. Of course, if you've got this far and you sort of think, oh, I don't think this is much value and you haven't downloaded it, don't download the paper. Uh, I, I don't want to count a download if, uh, if you're just doing it to make me feel good. If, if you feel you benefited, then, then why not uh, let me benefit by seeing uh, that metric increase legitimately. So with that, um, one other thing I will say, I know it sounded like there were quite a few people outside of Indonesia that were, were tuned in in different countries. Uh, I'm quite open to if you, particularly, I guess, if you have an affiliation with a local university in, in your particular country or where you are right now, uh, I've, I've done talks in 54 different countries. I'm happy to do more in some of those same ones. But if you're in a country right now that isn't in my current 54, I'd be very excited uh, to, to hear from you if you think you can help me arrange a webinar like this. Um, I'm happy to do webinars that are much smaller in scale. Um, you know, 20 or 30, uh, I still find uh, quite exciting. 
this one has, has blown those numbers out of the water and, and uh, that's even better. So I open uh, my offer to, to any of you that if you think you can help arrange uh, a similar webinar to this at your local university or university you, you have an affiliation with, either in, in Indonesia or outside Indonesia, wherever, email me. Uh, my email address is very easy to find. Uh, if you Google my name, it, it's a very uh, uncommon name in the world, so pretty much I will be the first person you find with uh, the name that I have, uh, and it's, it's quite handy uh, that way. I'll stop there. I'm happy to take maybe a final question, if, if there is one, Rocky. Yeah, um, thank you, Robert. So last question is related to the distinction between uh, the so what and contribution. How can we make sure we make it separate? Sometimes so what is related to contribution. Yeah, look, it's a good question. I, I, you know, I think I, I readily admit that, um, you know, particularly in certain cases, it will be, it'll, it'll have a very f uh, similar tone to it. And, and I think my best way of trying to, to get you to, to challenge you with the, with the contribution one, because I think, you know, view it that you come up with an answer for so what, and, and it's probably going to be a pretty good answer in terms of why it's important. That should be largely confined to why the, in a narrow sense, the paper that you plan to do, or if you, you know, later, when, when you've written it, you've done the work, the paper that you've done, why in a narrow sense that is important to the academic community which you belong. Now, when you think about contribution, it's like pushing yourself even further. And one way is, well, beyond what the current paper does, how does it open a new door? Can it open a new door? Does it create a pathway to something that goes beyond what is just contained in this paper that is what you've linked your so what answer to, why it's important in that narrow sense. Now that's super tough and in many cases we won't be able to make much of an impression on that. But I think it's important to express it that way because the papers that really turn out to be hugely impactful in an academic sense are the ones that start a new stream of literature. And they're the ones that can claim this broader level of contribution. And that broader level of contribution goes beyond that it's new and novel. It goes beyond in a narrow sense that it's important around what you've delivered in this paper. The other way of looking at it is go and have a look, go and read more closely the introduction section of tier one papers in your field. So for me, I'd go to the Journal of Finance probably first up and, and find in the introduction section and pretty much all those good papers will have some paragraphs in there and, and typically they'll use the word contribution and they'll talk about what their main contribution is. They might have a few strands of that contribution. And you'll see that in many of those well-written papers, they they couch their discussion of the contribution. It, it's more than just saying it's important to the literature, but it will actually, will see, you know, the good ones, the ones that have broad reach will say, we make a contribution, and they might say in three fields or three ways, and they'll make a statement about this first area of research, this second area, and this third area. And so, when you think about it, if you have an answer around the importance, it's probably just going to be one overall theme of why this research is important. And now that contribution, that multidimensional contribution uh, story is one where you're saying, well, it's important to extend our understanding or knowledge in this pocket of literature of finance. And this second one, and sometimes there are, uh, they're able to make a case for even a third, although for most of us, if we can say we're, we're helping in one or two areas, that's going to be uh, a pretty good result. So it's, it's sort of these, they, they could be subtle ways or not so subtle ways of how you, in terms of your statement of contribution, you, you as 
credibly as you can, amp up. So amp up, basically magnify or, or, or elucidate what is the bigger thing that this research might lead to that people will sit back in, you know, even in the near future and say, wow, now that paper does make a contribution. And it's, it's more than just what it was narrowly important for at the time. It's where it's leading us to the next big thing in the field. Right. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Robert Faf. So I think the intention of this pitching uh, research framework is to, to uh, mediate communication. So it should have uh, drive us in that way to engage in communication, right? Yep. Okay. But particularly, you know, um, you, you give the best answer you can, but know that, especially early on, there's a lot of uncertainty. So, you know, partly it's, well, here's what I think it might be related to, and then your, your mentor reads that and says, okay, why don't you think, you know, I, I, you know, I either like what you say there, or I don't, you know, I, I'm a bit confused, and it starts a conversation and that okay. develops how the next iteration of your project um, is, is sort of on a pathway, hopefully, to, to something really good. Right, okay, exactly. Thank you so much, Robert Faust. So I think we are reaching now the end of our session. So with, um, yeah, with heavy heart, I have to uh, conclude our meeting, our session today. Um, so this uh, research framework, uh, pitching research framework, is uh, a very useful, versatile tool for us. And um, I think if we return back to the, the, the beginning of this session where we see the uh, three panels comic, we can imagine next time when we see or meet with our supervisors, we can have a much more fruitful conversation rather than just have a look at it. So, yes. yeah. And I hope this uh, session will be fruitful for everyone. And I, I'm, um, I apologize if I cannot take all of the questions. And I hope this will give us inspiration and give us courage, especially the, the young uh, researchers, not to be afraid of supervisor, but to really get it down on writing. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I will end the session here. Bye.